Hello everyone, welcome to yet another day in this The Clown Decade, and thankfully Politics Joe has decided to start the Extreme Britain series again, meaning that it is free content for me, and this week they have decided to go down the route of heading over to Brighton, the gayest city in the UK, to ask people what they think of politicians being transphobic, quote unquote. And it is my job to listen to what they say and give my takes on, well, their takes, because I'm finding this rather fun and more importantly, it's quite easy content that a lot of people seem to be liking, so I'm going to take advantage of that. Anyway, Politics Joe, do take it away. Trans people are infiltrating your spaces. Trans people using the toilets is the issue here. Like, Well, and let's just get this out of the way early. It is pretty much only women saying that because men don't really care. And there's a rather large reason for that, and that's because, well, men overwhelmingly are stronger than women and women genuinely feel threatened by the presence of men in spaces where, well, they feel like there shouldn't be any men whatsoever. So yes, it is a problem for a lot of women, actually, and it's perfectly reasonable to say, no, I don't want a unisex toilet, or no, I don't want trans women in my bathrooms. Again, coming from America, you see the UK in such a forward-thinking way, mm. and I feel like in the last, like, three, four years, it's just gone completely backwards, like... No, no, Britain is still fairly forward-thinking, it's just we've ended up in a 30-year-long, probably longer if you Peter Hitchens, experiment that has turned out to be effectively just wrong. So people are in our parliament trying to get a handle on the issue, you know, trying to stop schools from keeping the fact that their kids are transitioning at school from their parents, investigating Tavistock that was, quite frankly, from what most of the doctors are saying, was just completely co-opted by mermaids that, again, their CEO was perfectly happy to take their 16-year-old son over to Thailand to have surgery to make changes to the bottom half of their body, I think is the way I'm going to put this. And I think it's reasonable to protect other children from these mentalists, and I have no problem saying this. I suppose what Susie Green did, the CEO of Mermaids, was perfectly legal, but uh, I will also say it used to be perfectly legal to take 14-year-olds to Germany to shag them there, and the Germans had to change the law because too many nonces in Britain were at the receiving end of vigilante justice. Luckily, this type of thing isn't as common with trans kids because majority of trans people don't even get the surgery. And they're just playing on people's fear. People are scared for a lot of reasons at the moment, and I think the media are channeling that into one easy target rather than people standing up and looking at what's really going on in the world. Look, the trans issue is something that I have been following for some time. In fact, I, I, I was one of the people who was taking a look at Tavistock and Mermaids before they really got mainstream, and I decide what is currently mainstream by what my parents know and don't know. But the only people that are scared of trans women, let's be fair, it is only trans women that people really care about. No one cares about trans men because the issues everyone talks about here are women's sports, which obviously the men are going to be better than, well, women who are LARPing as men. And of course, you know, women's private spaces, the changing room, the prisons, the toilets, whatever. Men don't really care because men aren't going to be threatened again by a woman in that space. Women are though for fairly obvious reasons and we have plenty of evidence to suggest that actually it is dangerous for trans women to be in women's prisons as obviously sexual assaults happen. When it comes to the toilets and changing rooms it's probably not as dangerous because a lot of trans women seem to be going to women's prisons for sexual assault charges and so obviously they just do it again. But that doesn't mean that you know, these women don't have unfounded fears. And of course, there have been news stories of women being assaulted in these places, so of course women are going to be worried about that. And it's just the total dismissal of these perfectly valid and logical worries that does kind of blow my mind, but it's this whole, and I imagine this is going to be a repeating theme in the video, it's this whole, there is one film, but people have seen two different movies. So everyone knows all about these, you know, women's prison issues, the toilet issues, as they have brought up. They're not saying that they're not happening. What they are saying is that it's nothing to worry about because, oh, I've never known a trans person to sexually assault me. Which is great and good for you, but that is not exactly going to make women think, oh, well, I guess there's nothing to worry about because everyone looks at the news. When the Napoleonic Wars began, the various heads of state did not realise it, but they inadvertently sparked Brighton's sexual revolution. Good lord, where is this going? The barracks in Brighton meant a lot of troops were stationed here, 
and it's during this time that there was the first recorded evidence of the soldiers hooking up. From then on, Brighton became well known as a place where people could come to explore their sexualities and identities safely and discreetly. Ah, just so I thought I had enough reason to hate the French, now I need to hate them more for making Brighton gay. For the YouTube bots out there that are going to try and take away my monetization for this video, that is a joke. I, the gay part, I mean. I, I already really do hate the French. Brighton's queer community has flourished, with roughly 1 in 10 Brightonians describing themselves as gay, lesbian or bisexual. While we're on that topic, I, I am getting pretty close to just accepting that there's no such thing as a bisexual woman. I mean, obviously that's a bit of hyperbole on my part, but there are studies out constantly about women claiming to be bisexual and then actually quite a lot of them don't have any bisexual history. I mean, I've found statistics that make my point better than this, but this still kind of makes my point, so I'll just use it. But as you can see here, about 40.2% of women have self-identified in this study as bisexual, and then actually the only 26.1% have had any bisexual history. And in fact, from this study, men actually under-report whether they're bisexual or not. Probably so that other men do not call them gay, but it's always just a little tidbit that I always kind of like to bring up, just because I find it funny. Because it kind of goes to show that for women, it's uh, not more socially acceptable, but it seems to give them more social points to say that they're gay. And with men, I mean, that's so close that it doesn't even really matter. But if we're going to go hard on these statistics, men will slightly under-report whether they're gay or bisexual, because, again, it probably gives them lower social standing. And if you say you're gay or bisexual, I think women will be less attracted to you. That makes Brighton the gayest city in the country. There are a lot of jokes that I can make in this video, but at the same time can't because I do like monetization. Despite all this progress, homophobia and transphobia hasn't gone away. The rate of hate crimes based on sexual orientation has risen by 112% in the last five years. So according to the ONS, the past five years have seen a rise of about 112% from 14,161 hate crimes to 24,102 hate crimes. From 2018 to 2023, that puts it at the second highest compared to race. Um, I am surprised religion is that low, to be honest with you. Given that certainly in the area I used to live, you actually... <laughs> I actually have seen more anti-Semitism in that area than any other sort of hate crimes in the area I used to live. Then again, it, it was a remarkably Jewish area. However, point still stands, the statistics from the ONS do bear out. And I do absolutely agree that crime is something that we should absolutely stop. I am not entirely sure, though, what recording these statistics does to help anyone, apart from give leftists an excuse to make videos like this and say, oh, look at how victimized we are. Because I have no idea how these stats compare to general crime. I don't know how many crimes were committed in 2022 to 2023, because these sexual orientation and transgender uh, crimes could make up a percent of the total crimes. It could make up, well, I don't know, it barely even makes up a quarter of the all hate crimes. So I guess a quarter of all crimes, but, but we don't know. It could be completely underrepresented for general crime. But giving statistics of, oh, it's over doubled in the past five years, yeah, that's true. But crime overall might have tripled, and therefore, actually, this is getting better by your metric. But obviously, they're going to use the worst type of statistics that they can use. And the rate of transphobic attacks has risen by 186% in the same time frame. Yes, again, I'm sure that's true, and... I guess all we can glean from this is that transphobic hate crimes are being either recorded better or are happening more. It is kind of hard to tell from these statistics alone. And another th interesting thing about <laughs> hate crimes is that they don't actually record the sexual orientation, the race, religion, whatever, of the perpetrator of the crime, just as the victim. And so we're actually probably getting the worst information possible from these crimes, which is just who was the victim, when really, who cares? it is much more useful to know who the perpetrator is, and so we can see patterns of criminals rather than victims. Because we should really be focusing on trying to stop criminals, and the best way to do that is with statistics of criminals, rather than the victims, because you don't prevent crime from finding out who the victims are, and then, I don't know, doing nothing about it, really. I don't know what's been changed in the past few years, apart from we're recording hate crimes better that has been done to actually help these people. Because as we can see, it's just got worse. And what do the people in charge do? Do they stand in solidarity with a tiny minority that are vilified on television, in the newspapers, on the radio? 
In newspapers, I mean, I can see their point there at least, because in the newspapers it is reporting what uh, crimes trans people are committing in women's prisons and whatnot. In television and radio, though, I, I don't buy that at all. It seems to be doing the complete opposite. I mean, did you see Doctor Who recently? For those that didn't watch the latest Doctor Who specials, I have a stream going over the first episode, and I gave up after it because, I mean, the episode was just so bad, but they literally make the trans character effectively a god. Long story short, the Doctor's old assistant, Donna Noble, became part Time Lord, and the Doctor had to effectively wipe her brain of all the Time Lord information because it was basically going to be too much for a human to handle. And then it turns out all you have to do is either be a woman or pretend to be a woman, i.e. be this trans woman, and just let it all go. And if you ever went through the like Guardian comments section of the reviews of this episode, it is just people fawning over how much it is essentially just licking the boots of transgenderism and saying, oh, my trans daughter absolutely loves this, and oh, they feel so seen, it makes them feel good. I mean, it's it's a very brave new world. But I don't think I could give you an equal example of any television show or radio show that vilifies transgender people to the extent that this show decided to deify them. And then when it comes to newspapers, I mean, The Guardian used to have a load of TERFs on their writing team, and a load of them had to leave because <laughs> they were critical of the transgender ideology, for lack of a better term. And now you're just seeing absolutely ridiculous things in The Guardian as I go through every two weeks. No. They crack jokes about trans women at the dispatch box. He actually doesn't mention here that Brianna Jai's mother was in the Commons at the time, and at the very least he doesn't lie and say that she was in the gallery at the time. But again, a lot of the trans people that I know, they are perfectly happy with understanding that, you know, they are male if they were born male, or they are female if they were born female, and that they are effectively just LARPing. So they don't have a problem with Starmer taking the jibe of oh, you don't even know what a woman is, because they agree with Sunak's definition of what a woman is, which is an adult human female. And this is the thing, the ideology is the thing being challenged here, because it's absolutely mental. I wanted to know how those at the brunt of these issues feel about it. So if you're going to ask people about transphobia, why have you gone to the gay people rather than the trans people? It's kind of a self-report as to how almost all-encompassing the LGBT whatever ideology is, that the people at the brunt of the issue is anyone within that wide net of people rather than just the trans people who are the ones that apparently we're just talking about here. Because I really don't see gay people being bashed on by politicians, the news, television shows, whatever. But trans people, I mean, I, I can understand what you're saying you have a problem with. With gay people, I'm not seeing any equivalent, even from your perspective. For example, like, if I was by myself, in Dublin, I don't think I'd like really? dress like outland that outlandishly, to be honest, because you'd be you'd be scared because there's too many stories coming out lately of like hate crimes going on and stuff like that. No, no, I've not been to Dublin in quite a while. I'll be honest with you, but even I remember seeing people dressed outlandishly there. And I suppose to be fair, last time I was in Dublin was about a decade or so ago. So I suppose things can change. However, these people feel comfortable in Brighton doing this and they say they are fine, I believe them. Uh, and I'm going to be honest with you, I I've just skipped quite a few clips of people just saying I came to Brighton because I feel comfortable here. That that's effectively all it comes down to. And that's fine, but I I've kind of just realised that's kind of undermining the message of, oh, hate crimes are really affecting me. And I think part of the reason genuinely why Brighton doesn't have a homophobe problem. It's obviously partly because, you know, as I said, 10% of the population there is lesbian, gay or bisexual, whatever. But also, despite this, uh, <laughs> despite Brighton Council saying our ethnically diverse city at the top of this page, as you can see, it's actually slightly more white than the average England population. Whether that is white British or white non-British, it's 89% white, which effectively just means most people there are either from Britain or from Northern Europe. And uh, where the homophobia is typically coming from recently in Britain, yeah, it's not typically from your white Brits, and it's not even typically from your white non-Brits. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if most people going to Brighton are coming from homophobic places anyway, and it's people just wanting to go there because they hear it's safer for gay people. Uh, it, but it does make me laugh when our ethnically diverse city actually turns out to be one of the least diverse places 
in England. Well, I've got a, a, a female couple friend who they moved down from Liverpool and they suffered such abuse um, being openly gay in Liverpool and here they've just found their home. Yep, yeah, again, grand. I am glad people can live as they wish to, I guess, with within reason, obviously. But uh, again, it's, it's never seems to be asked who did the abusing what type of abuse was it because from people i know who are gay they uh, they might get the odd slur but it, it's nowhere near as abusive as a lot of lgbt plus activists or stonewall would have you believe i mean i'm not saying these things don't happen i am however saying that the worst anecdote i ever heard again was a decade ago and it was a friend of a friend they were in a band and one of them guys had pink hair and I could see why people would make the assumptions they did, I'll say. And yeah, he got beat up in the middle of Manchester for it. Like, I, I know these things happen. I just don't think when half of the hate crimes recorded are public order offences, that's... Effectively, I'm saying I think the stats are slightly overinflated. For one, the way that hate crimes are recorded, it only matters what the victim feels. And secondly, the fact that public order offences are put in the same category as violent offences. Because public order offences is just a... It's effectively a breaking of the king's peace. That's what a public order offence is. And I'm not saying whether they should or shouldn't be crimes. What I am saying is that they aren't comparable to, you know, harassment. They aren't comparable to violence. And I effectively think that a lot of crimes are put forward as public order offences to effectively inflate the crime statistics when it comes to hate crimes. Because, you know, I can't tell if this lesbian couple came to Brighton due to stalking and harassment or due to a couple of public order offences. Either way, I am glad they're happier. And, you know, if they are seriously suffering from crime in Liverpool, then Liverpool police should get onto it. You know, you know all about this. You know how it is with Islam and all of this LGBTQ community. My personal belief is, uh, and our, pers our beliefs in Islam is, you do what you do right and other people do what they have to do. Um, and, and the thing is, even if you're Muslim, if you're, if you're gay, if you're Christian, whatever it is, uh, I don't think uh, it's the best way to, to force people to celebrate you. I think it's, you ha you, it's your right for them to tolerate your differences and tolerate who you are, but I don't think it's obligatory for you to celebrate. I think celebrating is different than tolerating them. So this guy, I, I think, is a pretty liberal Muslim, where he is taking the attitude of live and let live, and I, I think that's absolutely fine, but I think that is the most criticism you are going to get of, uh, of the LGBTQ community in this video, where, where effectively he is saying, please stop throwing pride in my face. I don't want to see it anymore. You do what you have to do. The thing is, is that if you want to avoid this type of thing, don't live in Brighton. Certainly don't live in Brighton. Don't live in any big city either, because they all have pride parades. And sure, for a lot of places, that probably is just down to a weekend. But man, you go to Manchester, yeah. there is still gay pride flags I see on, on like restaurant signs like there's a big wagamamas i think on saint peter's square it's still got a gay pride flag on it it's had it for years and uh, there are still some people not understanding that i effectively see that as a revolutionary symbol of our ideology is taken over uh, and it's it's as douglas murray always says it's not an ideology of we got to the very basics of you know the gays are people now it's now gone beyond of the gays are better than you and therefore not necessarily deserve more rights i mean i guess if you count the way hate crimes are recorded, you could make that argument, but they are certainly overtly celebrated a lot more. And, you know, they have two months here. There's an LGBT History Month and there's a Gay Pride Month, along with numerous Pride weekends that are typically not actually within either of those months. So I don't know how long it's going to be before they add a third one, but it's coming and this is what people are getting fed up of. It, because most normal people, they kind of just go, oh, let them do it. But I, I think it's quickly getting to a point where it's like, okay, I'm pretty fed up of this now. I just want it to stop. Like, have your weekend, fine, whatever. Months, though, I think that's a bit much. When we spoke to earlier was lamenting them having... They said they were saying they shouldn't have to celebrate the queer community. They, they felt obliged to. They felt they were put into that situation. They said people can do what they want, but I shouldn't have to celebrate you. What do you, think, what do you make of that sentiment? I would have also loved him to ask them, you know, who do you think this guy was effectively? Because it is a big unspoken thing in this country that a lot of the homophobia really does come from 
Muslims. We don't really have evangelical Christians in Britain. We, we don't have a Westboro Baptist church. The most kind of crazy ones you see are Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on doors or people in the middle of, you know, big cities with big come to Jesus placards. And they'll effectively say the same thing as the Muslim guy before. Just look, we don't want to have it shoved down our throat. Do what you want. I just don't want to have to be feel like I'm involved or feel like I'm seeing it everywhere. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable take. I mean, it's my personal take. And I have gay friends. I have gay friends, actually, that are also fed up with it, by the way. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, no, it, yeah, no one has to celebrate. <laughs> as long as you're not, you know, as doing as the opposite and exactly. hating from the sidelines. Yeah. Yes, but then when it gets into detail of... People like me saying, I don't want a whole month of it. I don't want to have to see pride flags absolutely everywhere whenever I go to a big city. You know, it's on it's on traffic lights in London, for God's sake. Th then that's when they start having a problem. You know, th there's also been the numerous zebra crossings that have been turned into gay pride flags. And I think it's perfectly reasonable that people are starting to say, well, you know what, I'm actually sick of this now. It's tedious, it's boring, it's everywhere. Like, can we move on from it now? We get it. You got everything you wanted. And I also get it. There's still attacks against gay people, attacks against transgender people. This shouldn't happen. I completely agree with that. Don't know why that means you then need Stonewall involved with absolutely every public institution and every private company. I really hope the government get rid of it from every private body because for all intents and purposes, it's not really helping anyone and everyone hates it anyway. A uh, colleague of mine, uh, he stood up and he kept shouting, all of you men, you all think about fucking, you all think about this. And then I told her, we can all shout, but I'm not going to shout. If you want to have like a debate, let's, let's debate. Uh, ten minutes passed by, another uh, colleague of mine in class, and she shouted, kill all men. So I, I think like it's acceptable for them to mm -hmm. say kill all men. And if anyone says anything, like for instance about the Jews or transgenders or gay people, mm -hmm. you're gonna be, I'm going to be deported from the country. I mean, you're not going to be deported from the country, but a bit of a self-report that he says the Jews first there. Uh, but still, I, I will stick on point here. Yes, he, he has worked out that it is acceptable to uh, denigrate men. It is not acceptable to denigrate women, gay people, transgender people, as he says, the Jews. Though I think even denigrating the Jews is pretty debatable at this point, given what we've seen in London literally every weekend since October. However, we're talking about <laughs> gay and transgender issues here, so I'll stick to that. But uh, I have no idea where he was, where people were openly saying kill all men, because that's usually relegated to kind of bedroom feminists and uh, academics who think they're off the record. Um, so unless he was at university and off the record, I don't know where else he would be where this would happen. But but as I'm saying, yeah, he, he's making a decent point here. So I, I myself as an Arab, I think I compromise much more to fit in here than they do to compromise to fit here. I mean, the funny thing here is that... Um, I mean, as, as a foreigner, he should be changing to fit in here. That is absolutely what he should be doing, so can't really complain there. I, I think the bigger problem is is that there are actually a lot of uh, native people in the UK that feel like they have to change completely to fit in with this new younger generation that is effectively doing everything they can to make sure that you don't do anything to accommodate minorities, whether they be, you know, racial minorities, sexual minorities... What have you, so that there's a wider point to be made here, but he is very much making the <laughs> almost colonization argument of you people should actually change to accommodate me rather than me accommodate you. And actually what I'm saying is, well, as a native Brit, I don't know why I have to accept the government supporting two separate LGBT history months, a black history month, a effectively a postmodern neo-Marxist world, a woke world, an intersectional world. I don't know why I should have to keep voting for people who say they're going to stand against this and don't. However, I think Matt Goodwin is absolutely correct when he says that, yes, all this stuff has been going on for decades, but there is a real power vacuum in Westminster to actually properly stand against this, and people, yes, are fed up with the Tories and maybe will vote reform in, or at least get a few MPs in, and maybe we'll start seeing that something's actually changing in the near future. I mean, you're definitely going to get a Labour government next time, don't get me wrong, but... That might radicalise a lot of people into being, no, we need to completely stand against this absolute disaster of an ideology. Brighton Pride was yeah. fabulous, but that's changed big time. Really? Mm. Why? Uh, all the corporate businesses are taking over all the floats mm. and 
uh, lots of straights, nothing wrong with straights, obviously. Now, as I've said in the past, I, I, I do actually have uh, gay friends, so th this is my cope for having have gone to LGBT events uh, again a decade ago. But um, it is a thing I notice. There's a lot of straight people at Pride events, and uh, it, it is quite funny. In an attempt for their activism to make it mainstream, it's actually got mainstream, and now the older generation of gay people where it was actually a taboo and it was actually maybe radical we can say to openly be gay and have these pride parades in brighton the novelty's lost it's not novel anymore you've got brands coming in trying to up their image by showing that they support the lgbt community by sponsoring floats and as he says straight people have come in because it's not taboo anymore and it's while it's a novelty for them because they're not gay it wears the novelty off for the gay people that kind of wanted it as their space but the problem you know this is kind of a a problem of your own making you wanted to mainstream it so much it's now got mainstream and now you're complaining it's mainstream and uh hey maybe there's a compromise where we actually agree here because i don't have a problem with pride parades i'm just fed up of it being absolutely everywhere in pretty much every corporation you go to they're constantly sending out emails about pride you go to any city as i say pride flags everywhere and i think even he'd agree at this point that he just he wants to see some normalcy so that what he loves is still a novelty and, and you know may, maybe that's the way we need to actually phrase it it's look you've mainstreamed this thing so much it's actually the new normal it's actually novel to uh want a britain of say the 80s or 90s where it was it was acceptable to be gay but it was still seen as wrong for gay people to get married, as obviously marriage is supposed to be between a man and a woman to create a family. I know obviously that's the novel position, that's the unpopular opinion. And I do find it quite interesting that this uh, gay veteran, I guess we can call him, actually almost wants the 80s and 90s back, where there was actually a bit of danger to being gay. And it was actually revolutionary, or at least looked like it was fighting against the system to have pride parades. And now we can tell it's just completely mainstream and boring. It's it's just it's just lame. So that's quite interesting. A lot of people assume that we have everything we want. Um, you know, we have equality in marriage and age of consent and things like that. But it's still important that we keep retain our identity, particularly as other groups push their identities forward more and more. Sometimes it's particularly like gay men are sort of sidelined a little bit perhaps it's pretty amazing how lgbt rights became pretty much the big win of the 2010s when gay marriage came in and now again these gay veterans are effectively saying oh it's not novel anymore and i don't like it, it, it what he's quite literally saying here is we won and because we won now other minority groups are trying to get the place we had i, I almost think he's trying to say oh the trans people are now getting to the top of the victim hierarchy and i don't like that and I genuinely think that's because he actually understands that his ideology is predicated on we can only actually win when we are seen as victims. And gay men just aren't seen as victims anymore, especially if they're white. So welcome to the club, I guess, but you've made the rod for your own back. It, what, can you expand on that a little bit? Uh, I, I think that um, uh, we have to be careful that everybody is always included and that we don't get too pushing one group over another um you know so that everybody is inclusive inclusive you know i love how when he's pushed on it he has to revert his uh gay men at the top position to oh no sorry i mean everyone should be included no th this man i think has an issue with the uh, with the trans community let's say but doesn't want to say it on camera because saying that in brighton i imagine isn't a good idea is that amongst like the lgbt community is that yeah, I, I, I particularly mean that, yeah. yeah. You know, there's n not infighting, but there's a lot of, you know, heated discussion on some subjects, uh -huh. so yeah. Well, I, I'm not being funny. Again, that is the logic that you went forward with. Biggest victim gets the biggest claim in politics. So you make a victim hierarchy and, oh, wouldn't you know? Now you're all fighting about who's the biggest victim. And, oh, <laughs> the thing is, is that if you go by that logic, the trans people are obviously going to win. Because there is policy going against directly against that ideology. And there's absolutely nothing going against the LGB ideology at all. You've got gay marriage. It's not going anywhere. No one is even really open about being against it properly. I mean, if obviously, if I was in charge of the UK, I'd probably get rid of it. But there's no way I'm going to run on a platform on that. That would be ridiculous. And that's the point it's got to with the gay community. They've won. 
I'm probably even gone beyond one if you read Madness of Crowds. Transgender people, though, they never actually got their full... Anyone who says they're trans deserves free, prioritised healthcare. You deserve any sort of transition therapy or surgery free on the NHS at any time. No, they have these massive waiting lists. There's more policy coming out from the government to effectively say schools can't transition kids except in very, very rare circumstances, which is completely against what was going on in the meantime. I mean, quite clearly they are losing, which I am all for, by the way, but the problem with this is that, you know, as this guy says, it puts them at the top of the totem pole because we have people directly going against their ideology and they're able to use it to play the victim. So again, I'm not going to give you sympathy when you use the same logic to bastardise marriage or get Stonewall into absolutely every institution that they could get into. I, I've just got no sympathy, I'm afraid. You know, you don't deserve hate crimes to be done against you, but at the same time, this infighting is of your own making. So I guess enjoy it. Yeah, I think for young people, it's kind of getting more and more untenable in terms of just sort of surviving. I mean, financially, it's... I don't know, it's kind of getting horrendous. It's kind of a bit of a joke, really. You know, we're paying so much money as tax. I'm, you know, I live alone. I pay 1200 in rent on my own. I have a full-time job and a part-time job to survive. I've got two degrees. And I think for young people, everyone's becoming quite disillusioned with the fact that we all work our asses off and we've got nothing to show for it anymore. What the hell did he ask her? Why is she going on about finances? And also, how in God's name do you have two degrees and then struggling to pay £1,200 a month on rent? Because, yeah, I'm totally with you on the tax thing, but there is absolutely no way you're going to be for tax cuts because, all oh, the rich might get richer. So don't give me that nonsense, missy. But also, that second degree, what a waste of time. You'd probably be higher up in your company and earning more if you didn't end up going to university twice. I mean, I don't, again, I don't know what the hell he asked to get her onto economy and finances, but <laughs> I'd love to know. Even if you're gay, if you're Christian, whatever you are, you should preach. But you shouldn't force other people to do anything. I mean, I agree with this guy, and I am finding it very interesting that he has noticed that uh, the LGBT community, yeah, they are very much religion. You should preach your beliefs, but you should not force others to be involved in it. And uh, I suppose this is the thing. when, when you, If you look at pictures of old Victorian times, or even, you know, post- uh, or pre-war times, I don't think you could tell anyone what the overarching politics of the time was based off those pictures, whereas... I don't know, you pick any random high street in Britain at the moment and you'll see a pride flag somewhere. You'll see a rainbow somewhere. Depending what month it is, you might see Black History Month banners in the shop windows or something like that. You, you get the point. When Britain was a Christian country, oddly enough, you didn't see Christian symbolism absolutely everywhere. They, they were pretty isolated to the cathedrals, which, to be fair, are massive. To the churches, again, they're big buildings. And you may have seen a cross or crucifix in people's homes, but in shops, at least from what is said and shown in media, writings at the time, whatever, that wouldn't have been a common thing. Yet we see it everywhere, and we are seeing pretty much every institution turn into a large building to put forward this symbolism and effectively put forward their rituals. And so, again, I think it's perfectly reasonable that this uh, Muslim guy has pointed out that, yeah, it is equivalent to a religion. I just don't want it forced on me and I feel like it is. And that's fine, you know, I, I agree with him. What do you feel forced to do? Forced, I don't feel forced to do anything, but like in uni, in my religious beliefs, uh, I shouldn't be celebrating uh, like others' differences. Some differences, I shouldn't celebrate them. I, I, I have to tolerate them. The religion tells me I have to tolerate them. I don't have to celebrate them. But I was told in uni, I, was, I, have, I had to write uh, uh, and uh, I think it was a presentation, uh, and I have to I had to bring someone I think who was lesbian or uh, or who was transgender. Mm. I, I I'm not supposed to be in my religion. I'm not supposed to be speaking about this publicly. Mm. So that's why I, I was obligated to do it, and they told me to do it. I, I did not do it. Okay. So uh, this guy's English isn't great, but what I think he's ended up saying there is that at university. God knows what degree he did. I'm, I'm assuming it was English or something, but he had to write a presentation about a gay or lesbian person. And uh, as I say, God knows <laughs> what module this possibly could have been in because at uni being told you have to write about someone who's gay and lesbian, again, for me, it's, it's just a really weird thing to have to write about. It's, say if you wanted to write about Alan Turing, I don't particularly want to write about how he was victimised by the British state, even though he was, unless I'm saying... 
you know, unless I'm making the point of this is how the British state has failed in the past. But I'd much rather write about him, about how he made the first computer, how he broke Enigma. The actual achievements in his life, and, and this is the thing I don't like about the LGBT community celebrations. A lot of, an awful lot of it is, oh, look at how our, you know, past community was victimised. Look at how we had it hard in the past. And it's effectively just stuff people either had to keep hidden, or if they didn't, yes, they were punished as Alan Turing was. And I just don't think that's a great mythology for anyone to base their identity off. Because all it really teaches you is that all that matters is being victimised. Whereas really, I, I think it would be better to say, yeah, look, Alan Turing didn't have the best life because of his sexual orientation. However, despite all that, look at what he succeeded in. But that's not the way they go about it. And I, I have no doubts in my mind that this Muslim guy had to write more about how these people were victimised rather than the achievements in their life. And he just had no interest in doing it. And from the sounds of it, he, his uh, religion doesn't even let him do that. And again... It, it, you are basically being forced to celebrate someone if you are told you have to write about them and write about why they're gay or lesbian and why that was a good thing. I, effectively, I think that's what he's saying he had to do. How do you make, I think, in the UK, well, obviously in the US, but mm. in the UK, there's kind of a level of homophobia and especially transphobia that like yeah. crept back in to mainstream oh, society. Yeah. What, what, do you make of the, what do you make of that? I, don't, I wouldn't say transphobia ever left society. I, again... I'm not going to use their language. I don't think criticism of transgender ideology ever really left the discourse because I only I only really think it came into the discourse probably about a decade ago and even then it was pretty localised to academia. But when you have people who come out of the gate and say, oh, you know all this stuff you know about sex and gender? Yeah, I don't think any of it's actually right. Of course you're going to get ridiculed for that. And when it comes to homophobia, I mean... Okay, based off hate crimes, yes, it has gone up. Again, I'd love to see detail of whether that's due to police recording more hate crimes when there aren't actually any there, or whether there genuinely is a bigger cohort of homophobia about. And if there is, why that has come about, because I think we'd get some interesting answers there. But the whole underpinning, the whole kind of through line of this video is that, oh, isn't the UK government awful to the trans people and gay people when... No. They actually seem to be quite level-headed when it comes to addressing these sorts of things, and I swear to God, if the Brianna Jai thing is brought up again, I'm going to scream because I'm not being funny when I say this, and it's a tragedy that Brianna Jai was killed in the way that uh, Brianna was, but uh, effectively that is Britain's trans martyr now. And uh, as far as I'm aware, from all the messages sent between the uh, two kids that ended up killing Brianna, there was no reference to politicians. There was no reference to the transphobia you see in politics, in the media, anything like that. They were just psychopaths. And uh, given that psychopaths, when they do talk to each other, don't really care about people outside of the conversation's feelings, of course they were saying harsh things about Brianna and the fact that Brianna was trans. But to say it's a result of societal-wide transphobia or anything like that is obviously just ridiculous. Nobody wants these people killed, they just don't want to have to have them in the same rooms as them, if they are women, and when I say rooms as them, I need to be really clear here, changing rooms, bathrooms, women's prisons. It's fairly reasonable. You used to think it's so accepting everywhere, and now it's like, oh, if you're a trans person, then you're not welcome, and they're actively making it harder for people to get gender-affirming surgeries and just become who they're meant to be. Yeah. I mean, one of the big reasons that uh, there is such a big waiting list for trans people is because so many more people are coming out and saying they're trans and I know the big thing the leftists like to bring out is oh but look at how many people came out as left-handed when it wasn't seen as satanic and there is probably some merit to that argument but there's also the social contagion argument of you know why were so many people bulimic in the 90s or oh, because it was a big issue that everyone talked about at the time and therefore if people did have mental health issues and did have a body image problem, they thought, oh, best thing to do, you know, I'll eat some cake and then just throw it up. And I wouldn't be shocked if an awful lot of trans people today, especially if they're younger, would actually just be bulimic in the 90s if they were born earlier. And uh, I think it's also really interesting that the only way you're supposed to deal with these transgender people, according to transgender ideology, is just to affirm what they're saying, which any psychologist, I think, would tell you, yeah, don't affirm anything. That's not your job, and that shouldn't be how society deals with mental health issues, because it's still considered a mental health issue. And yet it's the only one where affirming care 
seems to be the answer, which I think is ridiculous. And it's because anything else is seen as conversion therapy. When in reality, I think we should be treating people with gender dysphoria the same way we treat people with, I don't know, anorexia, bulimia, all these other mental health issues where we don't affirm what they say. We actually treat them as if they have an affliction. And I suppose that's not a politically correct thing to say because I'm not letting them live their authentic selves. Well, we don't let an awful lot of people with mental health problems live their authentic selves because it's self-harming. I mean, people think because it's Brighton that we don't have any problems like that, but we do, we have a lot. This shop in itself was targeted a couple of years ago by a, a group, and um, thankfully that's, uh, you know, we, we dealt with it with the help of the local police. But And again, good on the police for actually doing their job here and protecting the shop from running its business, which I decided to take a quick look into what Prowler sells, and along with all the LGBT symbolism that you see on the screen here they actually have a back room with a load of porn dvds and uh heavy duty sex toys was another phrase that i saw here but well it's perfectly legal they can do what they want with their business whatever i do again though find it interesting that he just refers to the people that were going to attack it as a group again we get barely any information ever on the perpetrators it's you know a very met police uk saying we're looking for a man who attacked two other people with acid today and everyone's saying oh how is that supposed to be a helpful description what am i looking for a man that's half of london i can't do it without swearing it just makes me so mad what the media are doing they're covering up all sorts of things that are going on and picking on trans people instead what do you mean you can't do it without swearing you didn't even swear but again from all the videos i've done on trans issues the media and whoever else up top they don't tend to lie about anything to do with the transgender ideology or issues that are going on in the world about it. It's literally, uh, these things are problems, you know, <laughs> sexual assaulters in women's prisons who were, who are just men. Men and women's changing rooms that are making women feel uncomfortable and, you know, with private businesses, I suppose they should be able to decide how best to deal with it. But when it comes to public buildings, you know, that's up to the government to decide how it's done. And they've decided, no, nope, separate bathrooms, use the one that's the same as your biological sex. And, you know, <laughs> That seems reasonable to me. It may not to you, but, you know, what else do you want me to do? You, We have a elected government in place. This is what they've decided to do. You'll get Labour in place soon, and hell, you might see change then there. Let's see how your solution goes. Why, why do you think that is? Uh, I think they see trans people as an e easy target. There is a right-wing mindset that are very set in their ways and believe what they're told. And so trans people, for some reason, have been painted as the enemy completely. One thing I have found very interesting about this whole Vox Pop about, about well, transphobia was in the title, but it actually seems to have been a lot more about homophobia, homophobia, homophobia in the LGBT community, is that they've not, they don't seem to have asked any trans people anything. There, there haven't been any trans people in this video, as far as I'm aware, unless my uh, my trans doll has gone off again. But but typically, when you're asking someone about this, you know, you'd you'd say for reference, I'm trans, and so this has been my experience. But there's been none of that in this video. So instead, we we have people who probably have trans friends, I guess. I mean, they live in Brighton. But then yeah, come out with all these opinions of oh, you know, trans people are being targeted at the moment because they're easy to target. No. Trans people aren't being targeted. It's one trans ideology and two. Again, the issue is simply just trans women. Nobody cares about the trans men. Trans men never come up in these debates because it's the women who feel uncomfortable and frankly, rightly so, because I can understand how it's intimidating having a typically more intimidating sex in a space where you're not supposed to see them. And then obviously there's all the news stories of actual crimes that have been committed in these spaces. So... I think it's perfectly fair to see it as an issue and want to deal with it. Why do you think people, politicians, I don't know, anybody uses kind of trans people as kind of a, a football or like a punch bag or a scapegoat almost? Why do you think that is? Well, that's uh, the most loaded question I think I've ever heard in this entire Vox Pop series. The underlying assumption there is that there is absolutely no issue with the trans ideology whatsoever and absolutely no issue that people have run into with trans people. But again, all I need to point to is the numerous stories about problems that have happened in women's prisons, so much so that even Scotland have had to revert on sending trans women to women's prisons because there's so many sexual assaults. 
so to say things like that are just being used as a scapegoat or political football, it, again, it just loads the question as to effectively driving them down the route of saying Tories are bad, aren't they? Which I don't even think you need to load the question for. You're in Brighton, for God's sake. I think cover-ups, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> for their own bullshit, yeah. Mm -hmm. I feel like they're just kind of... Um, it's Easy target. Easy right. target, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, we're, I feel like, obviously, trans people have always existed and queer people have always existed. I mean, gay people, yeah, sure, you see it in the animal kingdom. There's no reason that you wouldn't see it in people. It's been, obviously, recorded in history, especially in ancient Greece. However, trans people, it's a bit more of an iffy one. You have had women pretend that they're men in the past, but typically, whenever they're cited and they say why they did what they did. It's actually typically more for a, I wanted to have the privileges of being a man rather than, oh, I always felt like I was a man or using all this other tra modern trans language. Obviously you've had transvestites in the past. So it's kind of like, did trans people always exist? Not in the way they do today and not in a comparable way that gay people uh, live today and used to live because you know you had Oscar Wilde in the past you had as said before Alan Turing who were people that despite the law were still following their for lack of a better term sexual urges you know finding other men attractive and having relations with them despite the fact that the law effectively would punish them pretty horrifically. I mean, what happened to Alan Turing is indefensible. However, you n never have really similar stories in the past of trans people. I mean, I suppose you have transvestitism, which again, in the past for a lot of people who were asked why they did it, it effectively comes down to some sort of fetishism. But again, the language has changed today. It's more of a, oh, I want to live my authentic self. And honestly, again, I think this is mostly down to social contagion. These people have some sort of mental health problem and they're trying to rationalize it. And this is how they're rationalizing it. I just, I think I, I, I really do take issue with transgenderism being equivocated to you know, the experiences and the history of gay people, because I, I think they are markedly different and incomparable as a result. But with the rise in society, um, in media, and we're getting a lot more coverage now, I feel like it's just an easy, it's an easy dig, really. Yeah. Like, it's something that they can attack, that they can put people's focus on rather than sort of to cover up their own... The bigger issues. corruption yeah i'd buy this if ever they pivoted from economic issues to trans people but they never do i think this is just a way to try and dismiss people who have issues with the transgender ideology because that's clearly all it is again the question was loaded in the first place why do you think they're scapegoating them oh they're scapegoating them uh, clearly it's to deflect from their failures well no because whenever they're trying to deflect flex from say their economic failures they're saying oh well labor doesn't have a plan economically you know trust me they'll raise taxes you know something along those lines they don't just go oh it's the trans people stealing your money or anything like that so i don't buy this and i mean honestly how little are you critically thinking if you do put this forward i mean th these people are just idiots as far as i'm concerned and are just following what other people have told them who again are either dishonest people or just people chinese whispering from the dishonest people you know na naive people i think is the nicest way to put it because i think if pushed on it they could not give you an example where they have pivoted from an economic issue or a corruption issue to trans people because it never happens yeah. so rather than saying you know like i don't know they're funding you know like wars in palestine and stuff like that they'll go oh no instead of that trans people are um What's the word I'm looking for? Infiltrating your spaces. Trans people using the toilets is the issue here. Like, I mean, I think using Palestine Israel has to be the most ridiculous example there because they don't even try and deflect away from saying that we're funding or supporting Israel. They just say, well, yeah, they're an ally. So I, I think out of every example you could have picked, you picked the worst one because that's one they're not even apologetic about or see as a mistake. So well done for that another issue of a lot of politicians being absolute paedophiles yeah. and then just pegging it all on uh -huh. trans females for example yeah um again no the tory party aren't saying oh we have paedophiles in our ranks oh my god what about trans people no they're kicking them out of the party again as i said i didn't even have to push them to give me examples they just gave me bad ones and again ones that aren't reflecting reality again th th this is probably just because there's a big circle jerk in the lgbt community of we can do no wrong and we're just the scapegoats when in reality, no, there are serious issues, especially coming from the 
transgender side of things and people have noticed and people don't want it. You know, the, the trans thing has come up pretty much independently of everything else. It's just, oh, we're seeing these these men who aren't even attempting to look like women in our changing rooms and we don't like it. Can you please make a law against it? And that's pretty much all that's happened. Get a lot of the blame for that. Yeah. It's so stupid. It doesn't really make sense. Yeah. Yes, you are correct. It doesn't make any sense. And that's because you've just made it up. Anyway, that was the last bit of the Vox Pop. I'm not going to lie. This was probably the most boring one because transphobia only really came up at the end there. The most interesting bits were the older guys who were obviously part of the LGBT community for quite some years. And uh, we're effectively lamenting that since it's become mainstream, it, it, it's just become so bad. You know, it, it's become mainstream and now other factions are trying to get in our, on our wins and put forward their own special interests or on the other flip side of that, it's, oh, it's become so corporatized and now a load of straight people are trying to get in on our fun and it was supposed to be our fun and they, you know, they lament the days where it wasn't like that but can't really say it. So, um... When it comes to their takes on politics, again, they just seem to make stuff up, such as saying they're scapegoats, where, where really, like, trans issues come up maybe, I don't know, once every two months or something like that in British politics, and most of the time it's something remarkably sensible, such as, hey, maybe we shouldn't transition kids until they're 18, or maybe single-sex spaces should remain single-sex spaces, things like that. And it, it looks like the trans ideology is actually losing out to common sense, so there's there's some good things from that. and. Really, when the big push against it is, oh, but we're just being scapegoated, and then they can't even think of any good examples of it, it just goes to show, really, that, yeah, this is just ideologically possessed people or very naive people not really being very good at playing politics. So, you know, they managed to get somewhere for a few years, but it looks like when it comes to the clown decade, transgenderism isn't going to be the big clown issue of the decade, and it looks like actually quite an early win for us. So at least we've got that going for us, which is nice. Anyway... That's all I had for you today, so once again, thank you very much for watching, and until next time, goodbye.